Hello. What's up, my brother? Oh, it's hot. We, we were just talking about that. <laughs> no, it's probably hotter. Uh, I think it's 104. Where are you? I'm in the shop. I just taught a class. We, we had a 300 BTU furnace going all day. It's, it's hot. <laughs> oh, my God. So, um, Helmwood Lumber just talked about hot. He's in Houston. I'm hot in New York. What part of the country are you in? I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's probably 15 degrees warmer inside than outside. So that's <laughs> that's the wrong ratio of things. Um, You're right. I, ha I have a greenhouse. And when we go into the greenhouse and we walk outside, we're like, damn, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sufficiently hot in here. Um, and what's really exciting is my neighbor's AC unit is like kind of in my space. So it like pumps the hot into my space. So it's blowing the hot out of you while it's cooling yeah. it. So like right now I hear the buzz of my neighbor being comfortable. So it's, it's great. I really enjoy it a lot. I'm going to drink this beer because it's cold. That's what it's about, man. Enjoy it. Yeah, it's it's hot. It's been a long uh, day. Yeah. How are you? How's your day? Good. I, um, I had a conversation this morning about Four West doing um, – did we – She's trying to take the reclaimed wood we do and certify it so we can use it in, in build, as building material. Yeah. Because right now we can't because it's not graded. Oh. Interesting. So, so what she's trying to do is legitimize it. I have no idea how that works. Yeah, it would have to be graded. It have to go through the whole process. Oh, it sounds fun. Yeah, it does. It does. It, it'll... Once that happens, it'll it'll be a lot more. There'll be a useful. lot more opportunity. Yeah, a bit. Yes, there would be a lot more useful. There'll be a lot more opportunities for us to, to generate revenue. Cool. Well, yeah. I hope that people grade your lumber. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope people assign numbers to the things that you make and and <laughs> and value them accordingly. I hope Absolutely. an arbitrator comes in and says, "This is this," even if you thought it was something better. Right. That's well, good. You know, the, the, also, the objective is to become a grader. Yeah. That's good. I feel uh, like I, I'm on some dating sites and I keep getting degraded. They they grade me and then I get graded down. They're, I'm de they're degrading me <laughs> like a little bit all the time. Um, you should probably just show your rings. Yeah, I'm on I'm on farmers only and it doesn't seem to it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't seem to be working. Um, it's. <laughs> For, I, I don't know. Okay, farmers only. Um, yeah. That's funny. Well, it's um, true because see, I I think and and I think you know different people have different things, but I I value uh, a partner based entirely on the horsepower of her tractor. Um, that's that's a proper country boy. Yeah, I'm not even in the country. I just I want I want I want tractors you know <laughs> do, do you see how would love when he goes you on farmers only too i knew you look familiar <laughs> yeah oh okay yeah that's awesome yeah yeah it's, um, i'm out there i'm that guy i'm uh you know i've got a profile picture that makes me look like this <laughs> this is adorable <laughs> all right so uh, i'm going to ask you some questions yeah that we ask everybody and then we can get into the conversation it sounds thrilling <laughs> um, what is your least favorite thing to do? Probably sit in a 104 degree room with only one beer. <laughs> you I mean, I'm sure beer? I could come up with something else if I wasn't currently doing it. But... <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm enjoying hanging out with you, but yeah, it's, it's just too hot. Um, what is your most favorite thing to do? I like to eat macaroni and cheese. Really? Yeah, Do like a good, like a good creamy, like homemade macaroni and cheese with some addition of meat. It could be a lobster. It could be a wallaby. It could be antelope based. It could be uh, a pork product. Any barbecue, really. You just put a meat in there, and it's gonna make it better. Chickens, you can put chickens in it. <laughs> These are all so, meats. Um, I, I like macaroni as well, but I don't eat any meat. You don't eat any meat. No, I don't eat any meat. So now, are you a, you're a vegetarian? Yeah. But you eat cheese? 
unfortunately, I love cheese. So there's this weird line where you draw where you're like, we need to maintain this animal in captivity, but we can't eat it. <laughs> well, you don't have to necessarily have it in captive. What wild animals are you milking? <laughs> I'm not milking any. I'm just eating the cheese. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, like, I, I, I have a preference to only milk captive animals. Um, I mean, you can milk any mammal. If you, can, if you can catch a wild animal and hold it down, you can milk it. Yep, you're right. You're right. I don't know what you guys are doing in New York City, but. <laughs> um, okay, so let, let's talk about mac and cheese for a moment. Okay. Now, um, when black people say mac and cheese, right? What it is is it, it's pasta yeah. with cheese. I thought you were gonna so, say it was a sex thing or something. I'm like, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it comes in a blue box. It's, it's, no, no. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> mac and cheese, man. Mac and cheese. <laughs> yeah. It's macaroni so, and cheese. Yes. So our macaroni and cheese is not necessarily macaroni. Yeah, I recently made macaroni and cheese out of spaghetti for a YouTube video, just and it was terrible. Don't ever do that. Because <laughs> no, my thought was that when you get the crap blue box macaroni and cheese, like you identify with the texture and everything. And I was like, well, let's just make the same recipe and weigh out the noodles, but then use like very much the wrong noodles and it was just terrible don't don't use angel hair pasta it's disgusting no that's that's wrong yeah it got because, slimy and strange no you can use regular you can use any pasta to make mac and cheese but you need yeah but you need well no you can't because the macaroni implies the macaroni but also like you need that surface area it's about the texture it's about the airspace like like a spiral noodle will work fine an elbow noodle will work fine. I mean, there's a whole variety of noodles that will work fine for a good macaroni and cheese. A shell, a SpongeBob. You can get a SpongeBob, but what you cannot do is angel hair pasta. It is just straight disgusting. <laughs> well, well I have Slimy, gelatinous mess. I haven't done angel hair pasta, but I have done spaghetti. And oh. my mother, who's from New Orleans, okay, right, makes an amazing macaroni and cheese but with spaghetti. So she makes a spaghetti and cheese. We call it mac and cheese. I mean, I'm with you. It just isn't macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Listen, what, once I got old enough to distinguish the difference, like you, I was confused. Yeah, it's, I feel like at some point you would go to, you know, some gathering of people. Someone's going to invite you to a macaroni and cheese party. Everyone brings their own dish. We've all been there, right? Uh, a good summer macaroni and cheese party, and you're showing up with the spaghetti mac and cheese, and these people are like, what the fuck is this? I mean, uh, this is, here's- you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But you should taste my mother's mac and cheese. I, I mean, I'm sure it's fantastic. I just, I truly believe that the noodle is, is integral to the operation because you need that airspace, you need that porosity. Um, now, you know, let me tell you what's happening, right? Yeah. You are, you, you, you are probably too intelligent to make a real, really good mac and cheese. I like Kraft. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I mean, I, I can, I can make, I can make no, man. mac and cheese. No. I, I, I can make it where I melt all the cheeses together and then you, you know, you put the solid cheeses on and you, you grate it all out and it sits in the oven for a while and then you make this cheese slurry that you melt over it and you stir the thing a million times. But you just cannot go wrong with that blue box using the classic prep where you use the entire stick of butter. It's questionable. You just ate an entire stick of butter, but you hit it. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the next question. Okay. Because we're going to be here all night with you. <laughs> it's an option, but I, I'll have to find another beer. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> this question. What is the one thing your spouse would want to change about you? If well, you had one. I'm single uh, because of farmers only. So <laughs> I would think if I had a spouse, they would want to change the fact that I'm judging them entirely by the horsepower of their tractor. <laughs> All right. What makes you tick? Why not? Oh, um, I don't like the sound of styrofoam. Like when styrofoam touches itself, um, you know, 
styrofoam touching itself is the reason to not touch yourself. It, okay, so <laughs> I, I, th that's the next question. What irks you the most? So we'll say, you answer what irks you the most. What makes you tick me? What motivates you? What makes you tick in a oh, good way? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I just do my thing. I just, I just, just fumble through everything. It's, I wake up in the morning and I, I think to myself, today I'm going to do something. <laughs> I usually accomplish it. You know, a lot of people will tell you to bring your A game, but I'm going to go ahead and tell these people right now, if you always bring your B game, Never show anyone your A game, no matter what. When someone turns to you and says, you got to try harder, you can look them straight in the eye and say, I can actually do that. Kick it in gear. Because I've been bringing my B game the entire time. <laughs> but I can tell by your work, you're not working with a B game. Your work is A game. No, that's my B game. My A game is like once a month when I realize I haven't fulfilled orders in a while and I got to get this thing done and it needs to ship tomorrow. I, I reserve that A game. All right. Otherwise, I'm going camping. <laughs> are you are you a camper? Oh yeah, I've been known to shit in the woods. That that's what that's what that's what I was going to ask. Were you a glamper or camper? Uh it's a combination of the two. Like I don't bring my own bumper dumper if that's what you're talking about. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't have a an appendage that hangs off my hitch. I just have a shovel, but um, I get it done. Right. Okay. What sound makes you happiest? What's that? What sound makes you happiest? Oh, it's definitely not styrofoam. Solidly not that. Uh, I don't really know. There's not a particular sound that I that resonates a lot. I really like the song Jessica by the Allman Brothers. I know all the words. <laughs> I sing that one all the time. <laughs> All right, what sound bothers you the most? Styrofoam. Styrofoam. Yeah. If you had to take a trip across country on a motorcycle, who would it be with? Oh, well, it would probably be by myself. I've driven across the country a bunch of times in an old VW bus by myself and broken down in almost all the states. How, how old is your bus? Well, I've had a lot of buses. So the current ones are in 87... Synchro, which is a four-wheel drive one, and uh, 87 uh, Westphalia, two-wheel drive. Okay. I have a 51 Beetle. Oh, nice. 51's yeah. a good year. I mean, that's, that's – you're still – you're still at split window? Yeah. No one cut it out and ruined it? No, it's, it's, it's a real 51 cross cooler. Yeah. I mean, some people, like, put – you know, they put a bigger window in there. That was a thing back in the day because – Right. You couldn't see out the back, and it felt like a death trap. So they were like, "Oh, right. make the window bigger." And it and it and it didn't know twenty years later it'd be cool. I know exactly. <laughs> no, I I like those. So is that the twelve hundred engine or is that the thirteen hundred? Twenty five horsepower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the sufficient. Does do you have the crank on there? The bumper crank? No. Oh. That that I don't have. That's pretty great. Do you have a gas gauge or do you have the separate tank with the, the, the valve? The separate tank. I love that. That's my favorite aspect of that. So for anyone listening that doesn't know this, the old Beetles and the old buses were a lot like a, like a motorcycle where when you fill the tank with gasoline, it fills this other little tank. And when you're like running out of gasoline and you feel the engine shutting off, you just flip this little valve and you're like, now I have one more gallon of gasoline. Like, uh, this can get me to hopefully somewhere. Um, the, but you have no idea is. how much gas you have until you're like, I have one gallon. <laughs> it's cool. That's awesome. I love if, you, if you were invited to a card game that could possibly break out into a fight, who would you take with you? Ooh. Are we getting in the fight or are we just there we, for the cards? We, we're there for cards and something could go down, but we don't know. Mm. I got a few people in mind that are particularly scrappy. I know a few folks that would absolutely throw down in fisticuffs. Um, but, but can they play cards? Well, we're just there for the fight. No, what, a fight may break out. Oh, if I'm there, a fight's breaking out. Like, I'm confident <laughs> in that. I'm, I'm showing up prepared. It's, I'm bringing a roll of quarters, which is hard to get now because of a national coin shortage. So... Uh, I 
don't know. I, I, I don't know a great card player. My grandma's a pretty good card player. I'd bring my grandma, but she's not going to be a good fighter at all. She can't see anything. Um, what, what card bridge? No, I'd be playing uh, euchre. I don't know that one. I'm uh, not a real card a, player. Euchre is a really weird game that not a lot of people know. Um, where you take like two thirds of a deck and do strange things with it, where different suits are acceptable and it's like if poker was played entirely by old people for no betting and they changed all the rules in a way that makes it more confusing um and so the fun thing is at any given point one suit is the most powerful suit but one card from a different suit is the second most powerful card just to really fuck it all up um okay yeah all right sounds like a lot to keep up with it's yeah, you got to you got to learn it. You, you got to hang out at more nursing homes. <laughs> oh, is that where your grandmother is? No, no, she's she's at home. I just before I got on Farmers Only, I was trying to go with this gold digger scheme and <laughs> it, it didn't, work, it didn't out. work. No, um so I'm trying to develop an app um that does sort of the same thing as like a Farmers Only. Uh, we're going to call it Hospice and what it does is it puts you in touch with uh, anyway, it's Oh, I don't want to give away right. too much. So yeah. what what profession other than your own would you like to try? Mm. I've tried a bunch of them. I've been a brewer. I've been a yacht captain. Now I'm a blacksmith. I, I tend to do some farming. Uh, I keep some bees. And uh, mm, I don't know. I think I would be a pretty good um, – no, I don't know. I'm a pretty good mechanic, too. I don't, okay. Nothing really. What would you want on your, what would you want on your tombstone? It happened. Right. Or they got him. <laughs> we're, so now we start the conversation, and it starts from high school, and it goes through the different things that you've done that pointed That's, you to where you are now. So I was in high school. I graduated from high school, and then I went to college. Uh, what did for... you do in high school? Were you just a kid? Did you play in the band? Did you play in the sports? Yeah, I was in the band. I played the trombone, slide trombone. Did some jazz, some jazz trombone. Uh, Do you still play? I I've been known to. I can play uh, the Celine Dion song "My Heart Will Go On" on basically any instrument, um, but not much more. Uh, okay. I, just, I just really I niched down and I learned that on just everything. You can hand me an oboe right now and I'll 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 throw down on "My Heart Will Go On." But, All right. I don't, I don't play much. I'd, I'd like to pick it back up and be able to play more than that. Okay. So high school, you um, played the I was on the, the rowing team. I played some Frisbees. And, uh, yeah, so I rowed some boats and I played some Frisbees. And, uh, you know, it was in the band. That, that Those things kept me sufficiently occupied. Okay. And where would you go to college? I went to Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania, the Slimy Pebble. And uh, I got a degree in environmental science with a heavy geology base. Um, I took two art classes while I was there, and that somehow turned into my job. Uh, and spent a lot of college sailing, sailed a lot of boats, um, did some racing on the weekends, did some weird things on the Great Lakes that sometimes resulted in some questionable attempts at sinking. Um, and where's the furthest place you sail? Oh, I, I mean, I've sailed on the West Coast and the East Coast, but I've, I've sailed like up and down the East Coast as continuous trips a bunch of times. I used to deliver boats from like Maine to New England and that one. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. And then so, high school, like, I don't know, not, or college, not, not a lot else. And, um, I got some weird summer jobs that kind of really led to uh, my main career. So my main career, I mean, other than my degree, would be uh, I'm, I'm a boat captain. Uh, I used to work on yachts, and that all started because I spent my summers in college um, teaching sailing lessons and racing semi-professionally, and then I then I got into uh, working for some private individuals with their boats and maintaining their boats and sailing their boats, and that grew and grew and grew. Okay, so you were doing, after college, you were doing the sailing. Yeah. So then I moved back to the booming metropolis of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which it turns out is not on the ocean. So 
what happened is you can't deliver a yacht in Pittsburgh because there isn't an ocean and there isn't yachts. So I, uh, I gave tours of the city of Pittsburgh because some people accused me of being funny. And I drove a boat while doing that. So I drove a 1945 duck boat, a uh, military amphibious vehicle, drove around the streets yelling at people through a PA system. And, uh, you know, my jokes were dirtier than Bill Cosby's past. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Another Pennsylvania uh, native. Okay, so Pittsburgh. Yeah. It's great. I went there great. five years ago. Oh, you should have come and visited. We could have been best friends. For a wood turner symposium. Yeah. You were not there. No, I don't turn the wood. I don't touch wood. Wood's weird. I don't know why people, dude, there's trees it everywhere. It is. It, it grows on trees. And what I realized about Pittsburgh, and I, and I honestly did not know this before, is it has more bridges than anywhere else in the country. Yeah, 446. So um, for a while, we were in contention with uh, the sounds like you took a tour, uh, but yeah, four hundred. I, I didn't. I, I was I was reading. What's that? I didn't. I was reading, but because I, I thought New York had more bridges. No, no, no. We're the all, the second is uh, Venice, Italy, but the the difference there is that Venice counts any. Uh, their four hundred forty seven bridges are actually based on pedestrian walkways, and our four hundred forty six bridges are all commercially traveled. Uh, so bridges. if you count only their commercially traveled bridges, they have something like seven. Um, so we have like a lot more. Um, one of the fun problems with having the most bridges in Pittsburgh is that we also like to liberally apply a small amount of salt to them uh, throughout the season. We usually just do it in the winter, but sometimes for posterity in the summer, we bust those salt trucks out and just, you know, hose them down for the fun of it. And that dissolves the metal bridges. So what you end up with is a bunch of holes in the bridges and there's bridges everywhere and it kind of sucks. Our bridges are falling apart. It's a you, think the, you think the government have figured that out? No, because we built a lot of, like we have a lot of bridges. Like it's, a, it's, there's not a real sustainable plan for restoring all the bridges. Like we have bridges that have been on the replace immediately list for 40 years. And you go under them, and you're like, mm, "Gonna not drive on that one again." Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, do you you're doing tours? Yeah. And how did you get into blacksmith? So I done some blacksmithing like growing up and stuff. And essentially, what it came down to is I had winters off because there's not there's a very seasonal boating season here. So. I had winters off to spend my time applying to jobs in the environmental industry and not getting them. So blacksmithing is a great hobby and it's a great winter hobby. And I turned my winter hobby somehow into a career. And for five years of giving tours in the summer, I was able to just gradually step back. Like once my ring orders started being a real thing, I was able to say, Hey, I can't work 70 hours a week anymore. Like I got to go to like just 55 hours a week. And the next year, be like, I can only do like 45 hours a week. Can you imagine? I know. It was a big <laughs> issue. Well, it really was because uh, our biggest restriction was captain. So you need a captain's license and stuff. So essentially on any day that I couldn't work or chose not to work, like three other people didn't get to work. Because um, every captain was paired with a narrator. Yes. A certain number of mechanics that had to be on. Crew. And office staff and stuff. So, you know. They wanted me to work as much as I could, and it was a fun problem. But that inspired me to build my business and even get more. Out there. So, it is. in the, the in your off season, you're working on your rings. How long ago did you start? Oh, I made the first rings like seven-ish years ago, um, pre-COVID. So you make the first ring, and, and who do you who do you make it for? Who do you give it to? So the first ring I made, I made for myself and I posted some pictures to my Facebook page and I got a bunch of messages from friends saying like, Hey, that's awesome. I want one. And I was like, okay. And then uh, the second one was a, a friend from the VW community. I used to do a lot of camping out on long Island with the VW guys out there by the big duck. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. 
So you might know my friend Mike, and uh, he, he got in touch with me, and he said, I want one. And I was like, okay, so that was ring number two. And once you got pictures of two things, people will be like, well, I want number three. And before you know it, you've made like a thousand of them, and, and it's turned into an industry. It's well, it's, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, so now your rings, okay, are you, as a blacksmith, are you trained, or are you just self-learning? Well, I mean, I'm mostly self-taught. I've taken a couple of little classes, but the the jewelry side of thing, I mean, no one else really does. I had to come up with all my processes. And what's cool is as I buy different equipment, everything changes. So exactly the process I use to make a ring today is very close to 100% different than it was, say, two years ago, three years ago. So, okay, let me ask you, is it a lot simpler faster more efficient um, it's more consistent and that's the big thing i've had to really struggle with because the coolest thing i offer is people can come make their own ring so couples and individuals fly from all over the world to pittsburgh to come spend a 14 hour day making a ring and i need to ensure that they go home with a ring so i've had to you know build up redundant systems and come up with processes that when I'm just making rings on my own on a Saturday or whatever, it's not, it might be a little inefficient, but those processes will work when there's someone else here doing them. So I'm constantly refining, coming up with new ways for people to, you know, have a safe experience here and go home with something they made. How much is your ring class? It's based on the cost of the ring and it always changes. But right now, like to come make a silver wine ring is nine seventy five, I think. Just and, that, and, that's, bucks. and that's for a 14 hour day. Yeah, that's for a 10 to 14 hour day. It, depending on your experience, you know, it could hit that 14. Our record is 23 hours. Um, that guy didn't know what he was doing, and it showed. <laughs> oh a, lot of, a lot of things went wrong. Um, that was on both of our ends, but yeah, I mean, we got it done. It's <laughs> the moral of the story. It's all, it always is. But I, I always try, you know, one of the things I love is being self-employed now. I get to work half days, like, whenever I want. And I'm sure you work for yourself. You get to do the same thing. And one of the cool things about working half days, well, you take a half day any day. And I tell it to people, and they're like, that sounds awesome. I'm like, bro, there are 12 hours in a half day. Sometimes I just work for 12 hours. <laughs> yeah, like, a normal day is, like, 18 hours. But a half a day... <laughs> There's 24 hours in a day. So like that guy paid for a day, and he got most of the hours. But I usually try to do a half day. So wait. So so you're literal. Your day is a 24-hour day. You're gonna yeah, get I, started, I started a class today at 7 a.m. and ended at 5.30, so I can come talk to you at 6. Wow. It's very how, hot. How many, how many people did you have in class today? Uh, today was one one on one. We're making it was a Damascus steel making class, a more advanced thing. And uh, with the COVID restrictions, um, that's normally a two person class. We can still do that at two person, but we're just not introducing strangers together. So you either book both spots in a two person class, or I'm not I'm not introducing a stranger to you. So that's just how okay. we do it. Right. Fun. Um, it was great. We made some cool stuff. That guy was cool. I like that guy. Good. And, and, and he was obviously someone with experience. Yeah, he's got a little bit of experience. He drove about two hours to come. Um, he wanted to get a little more experience making Damascus, be more confident in his pattern welding and the metallurgy and stuff. And uh, so we spent a couple hours talking through the science of it. And then I demonstrate something. And then I want you, like when you come take a class, I don't want to touch your stuff, like at all. So if I'm going to do something. And you're going to sit and watch and you're going to be like, why am I paying for this guy to make something which he's going to sell? Yeah, it's a great business model. Anyway, uh, then you're going to make something and I'm going to sit and watch and I don't want to touch it. I want you to be able to say this sucks because I made it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. That, that, the life of a beginner. Yeah. But I also won't let it suck. Let's fix it up. Yes. Yeah. That, that, is, that is the objective. Yeah. So like our big class, like I, I taught a thousand students last year. Like we have, we do mostly we're a blacksmith in school aside from rings, but we had uh, our, our beginner class, we make bottle openers and I'll help you through the first one. And the second one, I'll sit in a chair and watch you fail. 
And I tell them how they fail. I'm like, hey, here's three common ways where you're going to fail. If you do this the wrong way, it's going to fail. If you do this the wrong way, it's going to fail. I'm going to sit over here and watch you guys fail. You're each going home with one good bottle opener, and you're allowed to go home with two. Maybe work as a team. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to interject. You ask me a question, I'll help you out. But I want you to be able to say, I made this. And the reason it's completely backwards and barely functions is because I made this. You know, take pride in your mistakes. It's fine. Right. <clears throat> What's the largest class you've taught at once? Oh, we do small class sizes. I, I'm all about small class sizes. We do two and four student classes, uh, okay. five and six student bachelor parties and stuff. But yeah. All right. And how long have you been giving the classes? Six years. So how did you get enough experience to teach? I don't know. They just keep making stuff. I mean, and the other thing is anyone can teach as long as they're confident in what they're doing and they have experience. Like I used to teach sailing. Like I, I, I went to school. Okay, to right. So that's in your nature. So I'm like I took classes on how to teach. And then I like know how to do this. And, you know, I, I designed the classes to be something that anyone can, involve, can do. And that's its own fun problem because if I get four able-bodied people with experience in here for a beginner class, they're going to be like, well, this was kind of boring. But then someone, every time someone shows up with one arm and I'm like, man, you checked a box on the form that said you have control of your non-dominant hand. And they'll say things like, yeah, I lost my dominant hand. And then I have to pull my hair out and say, dude, if you got one hand, it's dominant now. It changed. It changed. That has happened three times, dude. Oh my God. You're a funny, dude. I, I, had, You're funny. I had nine to nine month pregnant people take a blacksmithing class one year. Nine of them. Not at the same time. Just people want to have a baby in a blacksmithing shop. And I need to be able to make sure that they can successfully finish the project and get out of here before they give birth. That wouldn't scare you? I have a doctor on call just in case. I guess that would help. That would help. It's crazy, though, when they, like, fill out the thing that asks if they have any pre-existing conditions that could be a concern or a limitation or physical, yada, yada, yada. They won't put down the fact that they're, like, you know, in their third trimester and ready to go. It's, <laughs> it just keeps happening. Um, that's, that's why I've really been enjoying this, like, little shutdown. Like, I have less students, and, and no one's given birth here in, in a while, in weeks. That's good. Yeah, it's great. What do you find to be the most challenging thing about what you do? Oh, probably emails. I hate them. I, just, I, get, I get such an ungodly sum of emails, and I constantly try to automate things so that, like, one of the things, and this is some good business advice, I think, too, is if you're getting the same question a lot of times, it's an issue with your website. Answer it on there. Let the people find the answer so that you can far more easily answer the email by just linking them back to your website. So, you know, I'm constantly trying to put out more value added content on my website just so people stop asking me the same question. Every time people are like, what motivates you? I'm like, I got asked the same question 14 times yesterday and that's what motivates me. Fix that problem. I like yeah, that. I, yeah. The fun problem is that it, it constantly changes what the question is. It's like right. seasonal. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. So when did you get into bees? Oh, I just got some bees. Yeah. Um, so like six years ago, my, my original shop was on a 50 acre farm and I had like full use of the land and I still have that other shop. I'm just never there. And I wanted to get into bees. I always loved the idea of bees and was into farming and stuff like that. And uh, I was like, if there's ever been a time in my life, it's now. So I bought some bees and contacted some, oh, I contacted some people I knew that were into bees and I got myself a couple of hives and I did a very bad job and they died completely and uh, learned a lesson, bought some more bees, did it again. And before you know it, you know, they don't all die. It's, I don't have a puppy. Don't worry, guys. I haven't learned that lesson yet. Um, what did you do? A couple of years ago, there was a real problem with bees. Oh, there's still a huge problem with bees. So, I mean, really, the, the real problem with bees came in, in a, about 1989 and hasn't changed at all. So the, 
there's an invasive pest that came um, to the U.S. called Varroa mite. Varroa destructor is the technical Latin name. And it's a little mite that lives in the hive, and it gets into the brood, and it, uh, it, it actually, like, implants itself on the growing bee, and it, it sucks its blood, and yada, yada, yada. And they carry various diseases with them, but the main thing they do is they put a lot of pressure on the hive. So the hives in North America are not native. They were brought here in the 1600s. There's no native honeybees to the U.S. Um, wow. But they have, no, they have no immunity and no control of varroa mite. So when they came in in 1989, um, I remember hearing something like that it wiped out 90% of all the native bees in the U.S. Well, now native bees in the U.S. in like a five-year period. 90%. So basically, if you were a beekeeper in the – 70s and you're like yeah it's so easy i'm like you have no idea what you're talking about it's not even relevant anymore we got this thing that is in every single hive it's in every hive and it's killing it and wow. i think of varroa the comparison i like to make is not that the diseases it carries is necessarily going to kill the bees but it's more of an immune response issue so think of it like hiv hiv isn't going to kill you but when you have it the flu will you know what i mean so it's just it's constantly putting pressure on the hive in a way that their immune response is really weakened and anything that happens then it's going to kill them so especially like we're having crazy issues with winter um the worst years for me with bees have always been years where the winter sort of doesn't really happen and it'll get cold and then it'll warm back up and that's the worst because the bees kind of, they reduce their population. They go into sort of a dormant state and they just eat their honey all winter and they're just sort of chilling. Well, if it warms back up, they start laying eggs. They start coming out of hibernation. Their metabolism goes up and they might start flying around looking for food. Well, guess what? It's still January. There's nothing to eat. So then they eat all their honey and they starve to death before spring comes and it sucks. Wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of various issues with bees these days that make it trickier than ever. But um, everyone has, and every region has their own set of bee issues. So nothing's consistent region to region. But at least where I'm at, winter is tricky. Varroa mites an issue. Um, there's other pests too, but everyone finds their magic trick around it. And mine is capturing wild bees from hives that survive in this environment and breeding those. I'm kind of the king of that now. Cool. I have a buddy here who, who's been a, a beekeeper for 20 years. Nice. And he says he goes up to uh, upstate New York to Ontario to, to work on bees. Could be. So one of the big ways to make money with bees, I mean, the big way, the honey's nothing. Um, anyone who keeps bees and profits off it, they're not making money off honey. The honey money's no good. You know, you got to get the, um, the pollination money. So if he's going up to Ontario, it's probably like blueberries. So there's blueberries up there. And the blueberries are planted so densely that there's not enough native bees and wild bees to pollinate them. So if you want to have like a, you know, commercial farm, you have to bring in pollinators during the right season. So they'll get a flatbed truck full of bees. They'll drive them in there. They'll let them hang out there for a month. They do their thing. That guy gets a bunch of honey. Bees do their thing. That guy builds the farmer. Hey, I brought these bees. You owe me these many G's. And then he leaves and does something else. So there's this whole, like, migratory route. They do the almonds in California. They do the orange blossoms in, in Florida. And these people just take their truckload of bees all around the country doing bee stuff. It's weird. Wow. Yeah. I don't do that yet. You're right. Yeah. You haven't Great. got the call yet. Well, I, I – I'm going to start this year. I have, uh, I have bees on two different farms that have seen really significant benefits from the bees being there. And I'm trying to consolidate my bees, but like not five different locations that I have to go check on every week. So I'll keep bees at your farm, but not because I want to. So, you know, right. pony it up, pay for the bees. Yeah. Cause the, the, the bees make the next product. Exactly. And they need the bees. And I want to have the bees somewhere, but I'm sick of – I have bees at five spots. It sucks. Every time someone messages me and is like, hey, I got a great spot. You can put bees. I'm like, no, I'm good. I, just, I don't need a sixth spot to go check on twice a week. It sucks. So, so when, you, when you 
um, set the bees where wherever they are. Yeah. Is it because you need somewhere to put them up because people need the bees? Well, that's that's my point. I originally set them up because I needed somewhere to put them, but now I'm putting them in places where people need the bees. That's good because now you make money instead of it costing you money. Yeah, and it's crazy how expensive it can be. It's not a cheap hobby, especially if you suck at it and all your bees die. Um, that's kind of its own fun problem. Right. So how do you go about marketing for your rings and your blacksmith? So that's mostly Instagram, Facebook, and word of mouth. I mean, one of the big advantages I have now is that I've had so many students, and I have so many reviews, and I have so many people talking about it that um, – I mean, just in terms of flyers, at, I, know, I don't know how many business cards, but I know I gave out like 5,000 flyers last year and probably 10,000 business cards, something like that. Um, I don't know where they all go, but I'm just constantly handing people business cards. And that's, that's the biggest thing for me. I have, I have three different business cards I carry with me, depending on how our conversation went. Um, it's, yeah, it's... Uh, only one of them has my phone number on it. Let's just put it that way. The other two are one's ring based, one's blacksmithing classes based, and then one is like a combination of the two. And here's my contact info. So, if if you're just some creepy guy that's like, let me tell you about this time I had an anvil. I'm like, I'll buy it here. Here, send me an email. But I'm not giving you my phone number. Um, and and I buy and sell a lot of anvils too. That's kind of a weird side hustle too. Um. So I used to do like some craft shows and put my name out there and, you know, meet people, shake babies. Uh, well, not shake, uh, shake hands, mostly kiss babies. Um, don't I shake did, any babies, please. Yeah, you don't want to mix that up. Uh, it goes wrong. Um, I, did a, I did a wedding show for the first time this year, and that was spectacularly weird. Um, if you've ever sold things, like I know you guys, you guys sell wood, like you've probably gone to trade shows and stuff. Well, imagine a trade show where you're there, like with your booth, but every single person that walks in doesn't want to buy anything. 100% not interested in buying anything that day. They're just there to get drunk on mimosas and tell people they went. The free food and drink. Yeah, it's absolutely insanely weird. So, like, it was my first one, so I brought a bunch of product to sell, and, like, we set it up, and we had all the prices on it. No one cared at all. No one picked up anything. They, they had questions. They signed up for an email list, but they did not touch anything. They had no interest in going home with any of the 600 pounds of stuff I brought. It was weird, but I got a lot of sales out of that because that's what they're doing. They're shopping sometimes two years in advance. Um, but another way to think of that, if you were trying to sell someone on going to a wedding show, is imagine 600 brides and their moms – drunk coming to not spend money and then you're like wait i'm not gonna not do that i'm gonna actually go ahead and that sounds terrible yeah right it kind of was that too yeah but it's the contact stuff that's how you grow your business you deal with 600 brides and their moms all right so do you want to talk more you want to give us a tour what's that do you want to give us a tour a tour yeah no of the shop Oh, it's a filthy place right now. I finished the class and just cracked one beer. There's a pizza over there. I mean, sure. I'll show you guys a pizza um, from Milano's it's next door. It's pretty good. Um, so this is, a, this is a jewelry bench that's covered in garbage. Um, this is where we do jewelry. We make the jewelry. And then this is another bench. First aid kit, very important. Uh, very important. Yes, this is a creepy hand made of wood. See the wood hand? Yes, creepy hand. Uh, orders that aren't being fulfilled and a Grateful Dead skateboard. And over here, we fill things with acid and stuff like that. Do some etching. Uh, polisher. This is a pizza. There's probably three slices left. It was pretty good. Um, these are some metal roses here. These are quite the nice. Uh, this is uh, various grinders because I'm very lazy, so I have grinders with different grits because I don't change them. Um, if anyone ever wants to rob my shop, this isn't something I should tell people, but uh, there's no money in the safe. It's all in this vacuum cleaner. This is the one we use for gold and silver, and it all goes into that vacuum. So 
Um, all of my wealth exists in a vacuum cleaner. Now you know. Uh, weld table from weldtables.com, built into a delightful little welding cart. It's quite great, and we're TIG welding some stuff today. Here's a block of Damascus we made today with a, I don't remember what we call this, mud terrain pattern or something like that. Very uh, nice. Yeah, it'll be cool. Grinder, big filthy mess, fridge full of beer, fire extinguisher. Uh, delightful mess, more mess, hand painted sign, post vice, belts, some stuff, storage, one hydraulic press, two hydraulic press, lots of tongs, there's more back there, forge, propane tank, keg. And you, and you make your own uh, tongs? Um, some of them, I like to buy them because I like to think that whoever makes those and is good at making those probably sucks at making wedding rings. So, you know, support the people that are good at what they do. Uh, I, I, I agree. This is a 250-pound Peter, 248-pound Peter Wright anvil. We call this one Taylor Swift. Not everyone gets to hit on Taylor Swift, but if you do, you make it count. Um, there's a little one, heat treating oven, chop saw, fire... Lots how, of angle grinders. How big is your forge? Well, it's it's little. It's you know, oh, because you make little stuff. That's this big. No, I mean I make all kinds of stuff, but uh, I I actually wish it was smaller. I'm gonna make a smaller one soon. Um, you, I I run an entire business out of a two burner forge. So anyone who thinks they need a bigger one is crazy. Um, but yeah, lots of hot signs so that whenever you take a picture when you're here. You can't get a picture without hot signs in it so that when you inevitably somehow manage to get injured, we call this Exhibit A. Uh, it's, yes, plenty of those. Uh, this is a grinder, mare braid, more of this. Uh, this this is fun. I just started playing with this today. This is a porta cool This is like a swamp cooler, like a big one. It go, you put water in it, and then it, it filters down over this cardboard and makes the air 20 degrees colder. And nice. up here we have a lathe, a South Bend G26T, and a wall control with all my adjustable wrenches. So I have the adjustable wrenches, I have the U.S. set, um, and the metric set, and then I have the left-handed U.S. set as well. So these are all set to the different sizes, so I never have to adjust them. Um, they're all Proto 706s. I, I don't believe in adjusting adjustable wrenches, so I just I buy them all off eBay and whatever size they come in. I'm slowly getting I, – I need to get the left-handed set in metric if anyone has any. Um, and these are spares just in case. Um, this is a shark. Uh, it's pretty great. Uh, this was my Shark Week project last year. This is a hammerhead shark um, forged entirely out of two-pound hammers. So this is a hammerhead shark made of hammerheads. It's great. And then, uh, yeah, wall control, plenty of that. Uh, here's instructions on how to make a ring. Um, you make it round, add creativity, make it round. It's pretty much done. Um, bottle openers to be tested. Water. I'm much cooler on Instagram. Little shaper. Drill press. I don't know. Bunch of anvils. Here's some of the anvils. There's more anvils everywhere, but there's some anvils. So how do you how do you find your anvils? Oh, you uh, let people know that you're looking for them when they're not for sale. So uh, best best trick on buying an anvil is buy one that isn't listed for sale. So like when I go to a craft show or a trade show, I always bring an anvil with me, like a little one that says with a sign that says we buy anvils. And I'll hear some people walking past and say, we have one of those out at the farm. And I'll be like, hey, excuse me, you want to sell that? <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be like, no, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a family heirloom. Well, I'm like, hey, without even seeing it, I'll give you $100 for it. And they'll be like, you'll give me $100 for it? I'm like, yeah, because it might be worth five grand. So, yeah, I'll give you, we'll start there. Um, and so I, I buy, a, I, you know, the thing I always tell people is if you look for the anvils that aren't for sale, you're going to find them. So one of the things I always tell people in class is if you take seven days and make sure that every single person you interact with for those seven days, you tell, Hey, I'm looking to buy an anvil. You're going to get three of them and two of them will be free. Um, and I say that because I have a 220 pound Fisher anvil. I got from the grocery store bag lady because I brought it up in conversation. It was a hundred dollars. 
And she was I happy. Have a, the biggest anvil I have here, 350 pound Fisher to my left. Can um, we see it? Yeah, it came for free with my minivan. Minivan, and I told them I wanted the minivan to haul anvils. And so this literally was the car dealer used to be a car, uh, used to be a blacksmith shop, and that's what they had left over, and they had no use for it at all, and they threw it in with the minivan, and now it's worth as much as I paid for the minivan. So once again, let people know you're looking for one, and you will get five of them. Very it's nice. Crazy. They're out okay. there. Okay. Um, are your bees close? Oh, I have bees. Yeah, I have bees uh, at four loca five locations now. No, um, can we see? No. No, no. I have to drive to them. They're all like not. Yeah, I, yeah so they're not close. I don't all keep right. bees in an industrial warehouse. I probably have about seven bees over there. I know where there's like like seven bees because I brought home some equipment and it had some bees on I could find you like one bee. But. <laughs> That's fine. What do yeah. you do with the honey? It's a fun problem. I don't really know. See, in the past, I've only gotten like maybe one bucket per year, which is a lot of honey. But I jar that up and I give it as gifts to friends and uh, stuff like that. And then last fall's honey, I took all that, put it all in jars and gave it all away to first responders and medical professionals when COVID started. So I had a drop box system I built on my porch. And uh, if, if you wanted honey and you, you thought it was... You qualified, you were helping people, you could come get some free honey. Um, but then I got like more bees. And so I went from having like five gallons of honey to like 35 gallons of honey. And I, I don't really know what to do with four or 500 pounds of honey. So I'm going to sell it to Gib um, because he just said that. Thanks, Gib. Um, but yes, you're getting your honey. And uh, I'm trying to sell it all wholesale to like a brewery, have them make a beer. What about beeswax? I use all the beeswax in the shop. So, but again, this year I might have more than I bargained for. Um, I'd be interested in some beeswax. I mean, and honey. I, I use I use all the beeswax. I mean, I go through quite a lot of quite a lot of beeswax because we use it to darken metal. So um, I have a really simple recipe. Uh, it's beeswax, turpentine, and linseed oil. You mix it up in a paint can, and you put warm metal, like 400 degrees, out of the oven in there, and it turns nice and black. It, uh, we call it snake oil because it's fun to sell to people, and um, gives it a nice black, water-resistant finish. Wow. Okay, yeah. we have 60 seconds. Why? We can keep going. All right. So, but in order for us to keep going... Because Instagram is going to cut us off. Oh, no. We need to get off and get back on. We'll do it again. Yeah, it sounds fun. All right. So, let's so we say get goodbye, off and we though, get off another 20 to 30. And we take some yeah. questions. Okay. So let's say goodbye, and then we'll be back, right? Yeah. Sounds we'll good. hang we'll... up and get back on. Okay. Goodbye. I love All right, you. Gib. Goodbye. I'm in New York. Jay Henney's in Cali. What's hey, up? What's up? Um, play a game called Still Hot in Here. <laughs> that was time for you to go and get another beer, right? Well, I got one, yeah. it's uh, We got a, a Fatheads Brewery Headhunter IPA. One you don't, board. You don't, you, do you drink Rolling Rock? No. No, I drink beer with flavor. <laughs> do you, do but, you drink Rolling Rock? No, I don't drink. Okay. Yeah. The last time I had Rolling Rock, I was like blown away how they managed to make an even less flavorful beer. Like, I was like, okay, it has to be like Miller or Coors. Nope, it's Rolling Rock. It's uh, they took all the flavor out. It's amazing. Yeah. When when I when I was growing up, that was a popular beer. I worked in bars. It's and it's also super light. It's like under four percent. Like it's super light. Um, it's yeah, it's interesting. So. Gib said it was bottled beer pee. That's true. I love that guy. Gib is, uh, he's local to me. Um, he's an electrician and he's going to buy some honey because he wants it. And yes, he's going to. He, he just thought he had an excess of it. Yeah, he he knows that there's honey and he's going to probably just come steal it um, at some point. But whatever. Uh, yeah. What What's other questions? Next, what next for you? 
what's next for me? Yeah, what's next? Like, as far as your business, as far as the bees, what's what 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 do you got planned out? So I had some plans, and then I don't know if you guys know this. I'm going to tell you guys something. It's a global pandemic. So I you got to have like, a plan for that. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of like okay, so nobody has a plan, and all plans are out the window, and we're just going to go with uh, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, sounds so, great. Before COVID, what was your plan? Oh, buy a building, turn it into a sweet place where I have like a warehouse and an apartment, maybe a separate apartment that I can get someone else that like comes in and rents it and like makes stuff and fill it with a bunch of cool machines and cars and restore cars and like have a separate car side and separate blacksmithing side and have bigger classes so I don't have to teach all the time, you know, go to 16 person class sizes so I can teach way less often and all that good stuff. And then like... I don't know, maybe you get into woodwork. Like, maybe you play with the wood, like, a little bit. And now I'm just, you know, now I'm, like, obviously the future is TikTok dances and river tables, so I'm just going to double down on those things. Right, I don't want either one of those. <laughs> I've been working hard on those. I've got, I've had a few months to learn all about how to apply a table to the river and how to TikTok. I can do the savage, classic, bougie ratchet um i don't think those were the right moves uh p possibly possibly are you on tiktok no why not i i, I didn't find a need for me to be on tiktok so it's are the you fastest it's the fastest growing social media platform they're really pushing hard on the diy content right now um and so especially what you guys do with reclaiming lumber and stuff, it could go very well over there. Sure. Um, the, it's, it's, it's a weird world. It's like a cesspool. Um, imagine, yeah, it's just the worst place in the world, but um, it's, a, it's a black hole of iniquity, but there's a little bit of reason to be there. Like you can sell products there. You, well, you can market yourself there. Um, it's... It's just weird, and it takes some learning. But yes, there are content creators doing very well on TikTok. And what are you doing could, on TikTok? You could make a video of you like re-slabbing. Uh, I don't know what you guys call it when you cut wood, but doing stuff with wood and a saw, and put it to some music, and it could get three million views overnight. Like, I look they, into that. Yeah, I have a friend that started an account and in 30 days got 180,000 followers. Doing what? Woodwork. She's a woodworker. It's so weird, dude. It's a, it's a gold rush, and it's, it's confusing and strange. But sometimes you have to dance to pop songs. So your friend can obviously dance. No, she doesn't dance. So I dance. Do so you do TikTok dances on your TikTok? Oh yeah, absolutely. You gotta go on my TikTok. I'm huge over there, the Barefoot Forge. Go check it out. And you, and you got videos and you're dancing? No, no, I take those down pretty quickly. But they go up and then they get hits and then I take them down. I have a, I have a video that was just me foraging and I put some background music in and superimposed a dancing broccoli over it, and uh, as one does. And I had some weird media company contact me and be like, we find this video to be a huge potential. And we will, we're going to figure out how to monetize this. And we would like to include you in this. And I said, well, how about you just write a check up front? I'll straight sell you the rights. And this was when TikTok was like kind of new. Anyway, let's just say I managed to scam them into giving me $17 for something that isn't monetizable. And uh, and has like forty views, so I think I win. I got seventeen dollars for a TikTok video, and I don't think a lot of other people can say that because there's no way to make money on TikTok. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's pretty yeah. clever. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, but <laughs> seventeen more than I got. Yeah, I mean, after taxes, and I have to fill out a ten ninety nine for them and all that, so that's gonna be confusing, but. Um, yeah, Robert, you gotta you gotta TikTok it, man. I think it's uh, I think you could, I could see you pulling it off really well because you've got the charisma, you've got the branding, all the things that you do would go over very well on there, and 
there's a very quickly growing so the main demographic is a little younger but a lot the fastest growing demographic is actually quite a bit older and which is its own very disturbing thing because maybe they're coming for that and that's also uh, let's not get into that but anyway there are woodworkers on tiktok and tiktok's pushing hard for that content oh you got the wrong brother try it <laughs> i'm not i'm not going on tiktok okay I this ain't gonna do it. It's not gonna work for me. I'm excited for you to have said that and recorded it. So in a year, when you're way behind on TikTok and everything's on TikTok, you'll be like, "I guess I got a TikTok." You you'll be sending me messages, right? I yeah. told you. <laughs> yeah, we'll cut that clip and resend it. It'll be great. But no, TikToks. It's a weird. I mean, again, it's a terrible place. It's like the dark, shadowy place in the Lion King. Like, just don't go there. But, um, I don't know. At the same time, Simba went there for a reason. He thought, hey, this is going to be a party. And the hyenas were hanging out, and it, they seemed to have a good time. I mean, they had they had that place. It was like a jungle gym to them. Right. So. Sorry, that was a tangent. And you're like, I'm lost. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out where, where we want to go with this next. Okay. Um, no TikTok. Okay. Um, and I'm, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the honey part. Someone asked a question. It was Bliss Woodwork, Bliss Woodshop. What do you do with your bee pollen? Oh, I don't collect bee pollen. So uh, you basically have to build like a apparatus that tricks them into dropping all their pollen. And I don't know. It's like it makes the bees work harder. And I haven't done that yet. But now I have like so many bees. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'll like. Throw that on two hives. Get some pollen, too. I don't know. But so far, no bee pollen. So what, what does one do with bee pollen? Well, you can eat it, and it's good for your allergies. So, like, if you have... That's like, is, that, is, is, that, is that not the hive? No, that would be the wax. So uh, the hive is the, or the, the foundation is wax-based, and then there's honey in it. But they also make pollen, and they store it in the wax, but... You can trick them into like dropping it all and just end up with a mason jar full of loose pollen. And it's kind of sweet. You can put it in your tea and stuff like that. But it's really good if you've got allergies because you can kind of build up an immunity to it like that weird dude did in The Princess Bride. You can just like take little doses and then not die. Right. Mm. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's kind of coveted. It's hard to get because you got to get it real local. So it's the flowers that give you the issues. I don't know. Right. Um, oh, he said that's what he uses. That's what he uses for as well. Yeah. That's why he was asking. Yeah, I don't have. Uh, I don't have pollen. Okay. Sorry, bless. No pollen. No pollen. Yeah. What is? Was there a particular time in your business that you can remember that was a turning point, whether it was oh, yeah. good or bad? Yeah, very distinct turning point when I was planning to go back to doing my summer job and then just sort of didn't and was like, hmm, this is either going to fail or it's going to work. So that's when you went all in. That's when I went all in. And that was about two years ago. And I mean, like I said, I gradually worked my way down to there. I was working, going down from like 30 hours a week at the main job, which was crazy low. Um, it was like a day a week, you know. Uh, maybe two, but um, yeah, to, to doing this full time and really doubled down and it's working. I think, I don't know. Look like it's working. Yeah, it doesn't, it's, I don't know. I, I come here and I make stuff and then people buy it and it's fun. How many rings did you make a year? I don't know. You don't know? No idea. How many do you make a month? I don't know. How many do you make a week? Some. I mean, like, this week I'm working on, like, five. But I also know that, like, some weeks it's 20. I don't know. It's seasonal, too. There's wedding season. And I mostly make men's rings. And men, it turns out, are pretty bad at shopping for jewelry. So what happens, believe it or not, some guys kind of suck at this. So what happens is... They'll buy their ring like one to two weeks before their wedding. 
and then they'll be like, oh, but you have to make it. And so I got better, and I just charged them for that. It's uh, extra this much per week below this amount of time. And, uh, and they're like, well, why is it more money? And I'm like, hey, I had no intention of staying up real late tonight, but for a couple hundred dollars, you got me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I will rent a movie on Netflix and make your ring. Like, but yeah. Right. Gonna... They said, why, why is it so much? Why is it so late? Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. Website has said it takes six weeks for five years. You've been following me on Instagram for four years. You know it takes six weeks. Guess what? Your wedding's on Friday. <laughs> I mean, I'll make you a ring, but I'll right. have a lot of extra money. Yeah. So, do you have any rings to show us? Oh, yeah, I got tons of rings. I got some rings right here. Oh, I put them away. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Pull them on. Well, this, is, this is a ring. Um, so, they're Damascus steel. You can't really see. It shows up poorly on a FaceTime camera. But everyone has a unique pattern. No two will ever be the same. This one's lined in 14 karat yellow gold. It's the black and yellow of, you know, Pittsburgh. And, uh... Everyone's got a unique pattern, and you can come make them yourself. So, like, you made that pattern because you didn't know what you were doing and hit it with a sledgehammer. So, kind of fun. And, yeah, they're all a little bit different. There's no good way to show it on a FaceTime camera. No, that was good. Yeah. So, I make stuff like that. And uh, So, what, was that gold? Yeah, that was 14 karat yellow. Do you have any silver? Um, yeah, uh, silver liner is just this one here. So it's, it's simple, you know, but the, the liner is silver and we don't have to put a liner in it, but, and they've all got different patterns. The best place to see the rings is, is on my, my Instagram or whatever. I'm always posting them. So the, the Japanese term for like this process is mocha megane, meaning metal wood. So it looks like it has a wooden texture. Like it's, you know. Like wood, but right. like metal. Yeah. No, you cannot make a Damascus knife in my shop. We don't make any blades here. If it's pointy, we don't do it here. Uh, can you explain how the gold steel works? Uh, I mean, the steel is two different stainless steels forge welded together and folded a bunch of times to make a unique pattern. Then it's machined out, and we just throw some gold in the middle. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds like I've explained that a whole lot of times. I know. It's not like you hit play. <laughs> I hit play. Um, that's still in grain. He's a woodworker um, that's in Pennsylvania as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm in Pittsburghish uh, to the north. Um, but can we make a blank? Yeah, you can take a Damascus class and make that bar that we made today. And then I don't care what you do with it. You can make it into any pointy object after that. But here you go home with a bar. And it looks more like a billy club. So what? why don't you make blades? So believe it or not, this is going to sound crazy, but the insurance policy required to take complete strangers and hand them alcohol and a hammer with some hot metal is actually quite involved. And if during that process you're making a weapon, it's actually more involved. It's hard to uh, believe, I know. So uh, basically, I, I just, that's, that's my cutoff is we don't make plates. Okay. So, yeah. And we don't do anything with minors. It's 18 and up, and we don't make pointy things. No, I'm with you. It's I'm, easier I'm... to deal with. Oh, I get this question to the point where, you know, when I was talking earlier about all the website stuff, it's that question. It's that question all day, every day. It's insane. But, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, I get to make some cool stuff. Um, we do have a very unique problem in our shop. Um, it's not as big of an issue now that we're doing the COVID classes with the masks on. But if you've followed on a, for a while, you've seen this problem because we showcase it pretty well on Instagram. But people keep coming here and licking hot metal. And... No, okay. First of all, I saw that. It ain't nobody licking that. Every day. Every single day they come here, they lick hot metal. They, it's, it's enough of an issue that I'll, I'll tell you I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll give you guys the, the basic safety speech we're required to give. It's insane. So 
real simple policy here. You're allowed to lick anything in the in the shop, um, but you're not actually required to lick anything at all. If you want to lick something, you're actually responsible for determining first, hey, is it safe to lick this, right? Because it's a big issue. So we go through a series of tests. We tell them, hey, first off, visual acuity test, is it producing light on the visible spectrum? Like, is it glowing? Don't lick it, right? It's not ready yet. Um, then if it's not glowing, like it st still could be 1,200 degrees, so you got to go, you got to, you know, figure it out. So you use the back of your hand and you touch it and then you touch it some more and then you hot potato it, tossing it from hand to hand, ready to throw it across the room, branding someone in the face when they realize, Hey, that was pretty hot. Then, and only then can you lick it. I don't even know what this is. Belt dressing. Um, if, you lick it before, if you lick it before that, it's not safe and you're not required to lick anything at all. But the people come here and they lick stuff like you can't believe. I mean, it's like, it's, we're 10 minutes into class. We haven't gone over that yet. They're picking things up and licking it. So now we got the masks on and it hasn't been an issue yet, but these masks are flammable. And I'm concerned they're going to go in for the lick and they're just going to light their face on fire. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want that. I know. So I don't know how to address that with the insurance company, but it's... I got weird problems over here, Robert. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Has anyone licked anything in your shop today? No. That you know no. of? No. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're absolutely right. But I'm going to go on record to say no. No one's licking anything in my shop. Do you go over it with them? Do you make sure that they're aware of it? No. Like, do you have like a, because, a formal licking because, protocol? Policy? No. Let me, let me tell you, that's what you do, right? It's reverse psychology. If you don't talk about people licking anything, they won't. The fact that you have this whole protocol about licking, people yeah. be like, oh, so what do you mean? So I go over that whole speech and I tell them, you know, here's the process be before you touch something and then you touch something before they lick it and their jaws always on the floor and they're like, there's no way this can be a real issue. And I say, it's not. But now when you touch something that's hot and you get burned and you try to sue me, I got three other witnesses that remember the entire thing on how I gave you a safety speech. And they remember every word of it. So it's a fun trick. Yeah. They, they pay attention to say that. Exactly. Cause that's that, I mean, that, that, that'll, that'll hurt you really, really bad. Yeah. Luckily no one in a while has licked it. Well, I mean, we haven't had, since yesterday, no one's licked anything since. It was Monday. Two days. We've been two days without licking. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, what else do you make besides rings? Make a lot of weird things. I make, you know, hammerhead sharks out of hammerheads. Um, previous to this year, my biggest selling week of the year, always, was not Christmas. It was Shark Week. I built an entire industry entirely on Shark Week. And this year there's no Shark Week and it's affecting me quite a bit. Uh, so it's a unique problem. So for Shark Week, you make sharks? I make uh, Damascus steel shark teeth and you can make them into uh, necklaces or like desk ornaments. Um, I sold a whole bunch of really big ones to an oceanographic nonprofit that put them on display somewhere. You have any you can see? Yeah, in theory. Um, there should be a drawer full of shark teeth somewhere. Um, we'll see what we can find. Let's check it out. Um, so first off, this is just out. This is a raptor claw, Damascus steel raptor claw. Nice. Okay, I'm going to ask you a stupid question. What's Damascus yeah. steel? Damascus steel is a process where you take two dissimilar alloys, forge, weld, and fold them multiple times, creating a wood-like pattern. Did that sound scripted enough for you? No. You know, let me let me tell you something, right? When you when you answer that question, all I can hear you say is not another one. That's what you're really saying to me. So like nice. this is a this is a fair sized banquet on tooth. Like this is a three inch tooth. And then I do a lot of um, a lot of smaller ones, stuff like this, you know, necklace size. Oh, with a unique pattern in them. You put that on your neck and people are like, oh, yes, he has a shark tooth on his neck. Because, I don't know, shark people. I don't know. 
Um, I'm also trying to start an entire line of um, high-end boutique railroad spikes. So I've been making a lot of really unique railroad spikes. Um, where did this? Can we, we, have a, we have a question from uh, one of our bread making friends. Okay. A bread maker. Yeah. Yep. She, she's in Cali. Yeah. Um, do, you sell, do you sell honey to bread makers? I'm selling all the honey to one person and it could be a bread maker. It could be. Um, How did you get into making shark teeth? Shark week. So I did hashtag research and I realized that at the time, Shark Week was like the fifth biggest event in the U.S. Um, and no one was marketing to that. It was bigger than Fourth of July and smaller than Christmas. Wow. So I did that. Um, yeah, so I do boutique railroad spikes. Like this is a titanium, grade five titanium railroad spike. I'm doing some in zirconium, niobium, copper, stainless Damascus. Uh, here's a carbon Damascus one right here. Um, you know, you can see the pattern here. I'll flip it around. Um, and, and what, <laughs> yes, Jason. What do, what do people use those for? Nothing. It's really stupid. This is a $1,000 solution to a $1 problem. That's sort of what I like to specialize in. Very nice. Yeah, it's fun. Um, so yeah, I, I do like making the boutique railroad spikes uh, for the railroad spike enthusiasts out there. Um, I think I need a Neobium railroad spike in your life. Well, I happen to have one right here. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait. Oh, this is a zirconium one. Some assembly required, but it's rough forged, needs some grinding, it's super long. I can make uh, extra long ones. It can be up to 14 inches long. Here's a copper one, 100% pure copper. Um, and that was wow. like... I Let me see that copper again. Yeah. Nice. Still got to finish it off. But from what I remember, the zirconium one, or the, yeah, the zirconium one, the guy told me that the piece of metal we used had a retail price of $5,000. Like the raw material. Good lord. Yeah. So I just get really expensive things and make it into railroad spikes. So if 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 the material is five grand, hell how much is the spike when you finish working with it? Well, no one's gonna buy it. It would be like a lot of money. Right. So what happens? I'm gonna put it in a drawer with the other ones. Do you have one? I have one. Yeah, see? You don't have I don't. One. I don't have one. Um, so I have a. I, I'm lucky. I have a. Uh, one of the greatest things about having a lot of students and a lot of people that physically come through my shop um, is that I make friends with like a lot of people, and they work in all different walks of life. And so I had one guy come in, and he says, "I run an exotic metal re recycling yard." Like. We are a regional supplier. We buy up from small shops that have zirconium, niobium, titanium, uh, stuff like that. Um, almost all like aerospace industry stuff, their mistakes and stuff. And we are the ones that like ship it overseas. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, you need titanium? I'm like, yeah, I always look for titanium. He's like, we have 17,000 pounds in stock right now. What do you want? And I was like, seriously? He's like, yeah, give me some dimensions. I'll fill a bucket. And I'm like, okay. So, so, so and, 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 it, and it's, 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 and that's how you talk about relationships and that's how relationships work. Yeah. You went from needing something to a guy having more than you would ever need. Hilarious amounts. Um, to the point where like I was at workbench con and I was talking with a friend of mine and I was showing him my titanium railroad spike. He's like, this is insane. This would cost like a lot of money to make. I'm like, yeah, it would cost like, like a lot of money to make. It's like, why would you make it? I'm like, because it would cost a lot of money to make. And it cost me nothing. And it was like a fun Saturday with my buddies to see if we could. And so uh, like the zirconium one. So he's been bringing us all these crazy materials that like, you can't find anything online on like, what are the forging properties of zirconium? 
So we've got all these like hobbyist metalware just together and we're like, I don't know if this is going to work, but we should try it. Definitely should try it. So yeah, he brought like a six inch round bar of pure neobia or pure zirconium. And it was like supposedly like five grand. And we just cut wow. it up and um, I don't have any anim adamantium. But I do have a line on the world's largest supplier of niobium. Um, I can get niobium in basically any form as a sample. It's great. Uh, and that's quite weird. That's what's used in superconductors. So, like, uh, I have a piece of a CERN Large Hadron Collider over there in a drawer. I'm going to make a railroad spike out of it. Wow. That, that's, uh, that's Kingfisher form. He is in, um, you have vibranium. He is in Missouri, and he yeah. has a big farm, too. He's got 77 acres. Oh, 77 acres. What do you farm? What does he farm? Um, he has chickens. Oh, that's, those are good. Yeah, this is an no. agricultural podcast, right? You know what? No, no, you're right. Agricultural based, but not only. So we talk to everybody. Metal so workers, bee I, I, lovers. I, I started a podcast when COVID hit. Um, I don't know if you've listened to our podcast, The Maker's Happy Hour, with my friend Lindsay, you know, Woodbrain, um, Lindsay Zulich. So she's a cool cat. You should have her on here. But um, basically, we started a thing when, you know, quarantine stuff started just to chat with some friends and see how they're doing and ask them all the questions they're not used to being asked. So we're going to ask woodworkers about gardening, um, you know, stuff like that. Just really throw them off. And uh, we did daily episodes for a while. So we're up really high in the episodes. And it's what's funny is it has turned into an agricultural podcast. Like I edited a couple episodes the other day. And every time we're talking about tractors, we're talking about chickens, we're talking about bees, gardening. It's it. I don't know. We started an agricultural podcast. Chickens, ducks, pheasants, quails, cows. Awesome, man. Some of those things fly, and some of them are cows. Yeah, we did a conversation with him the other day, Monday morning. Yeah. And we did a tour of his, uh, his farm, his land. Yeah. Very nice. I used to do a fair bit of farming. Um, I got into it, and the problem with, I don't know if you've ever done any chicken farming or any poultry, but basically what happens chickens are a gateway drug so you start out with a couple of cute little chicks in the spring and before you know it you got like 10 chickens and then you're like okay well they call this chicken math it's a fun problem because if you got 10 chickens you're, and someone offers you like two free chickens you're like well if i had 12 chickens it really wouldn't be any more work like they'd fit in the coop and i'd still feed them once a day then you got 12 chickens and then someone else is like hey man i got these three chickens like you need some chickens and you're like yeah fine so now you got 15 chickens before you know it i got to the point where i had 55 chickens or somewhere around there because i stopped counting them a bunch of roosters and eight ducks living in my garage um like in my residential home i had eight ducks that i had to take in a wheelbarrow out to the backyard every day and i was like this is when i'm done so i quit cold turkey and i killed my turkey we ate that and uh been all downhill since there wow yeah it's terrible do not get into i mean game birds is another i do not envy anyone with game birds that sounds just horrific you get a couple golden pheasants before you know it you're like getting into peacocks well never stops on it's and terrible. on and on it's terrible it's absolutely terrible i yeah this is why i don't have land it would be I need to live somewhere where I can't farm because I always have this like natural temptation to farm things. All right. Do you have that? Do you have any pets, Robert? I have a cat. You have a cat? What's your cat's name? Abigail. How old is she? 12. That's pretty old. Yeah. My cat's 19. He's like the equivalent of Stan Lee on his last legs. He's just a very old what, man that's cantankerous. What, what, what's your cat's name? Toby. He's an asshole, and we love him. He's, uh, no, he's, he's, he's fantastic, but at this point, it's his house. Pretty like, much. Yeah. 
he's pretty old, you know. Um, he's a good dude, though. I like, I like, I like him. He, uh, he wants to spend roughly seven to thirteen minutes a day with me, and he gets to decide when, which is very important. And and I have to give him those seven to thirteen minutes. The fun thing is, I don't know if it's seven or thirteen minutes. You know, it's it's crazy. And then you give him one minute too much, it's a big issue. Like, right. Yeah. So that's awesome. Have you been working from home at all with all this? Like, is your cat getting anxiety from not getting to nap all day? No, I, I've been working. I never stopped. Great. Awesome. It, we, we've had, we've been lucky. We've had some big jobs that have kept us busy. So that's, you know, made, made, made it seem less weird. Yeah, but also really weird at the same time. Yeah, because I've heard things about – you're in New York, right? Yeah. It's crazy. I had a friend that uh, she got out of there. She's from here. She was living in Manhattan. She got out of there, and she's told some, like, just – it was like the beginning of the the TV show Walking Dead. Like, streets yeah, that's, what, that's what Texas is now. Really? Well, so I had a <laughs> – I had a guy by the other day that said something like, can you imagine if you were in a coma and you woke up to like this situation? And I said, bro, that is literally the beginning of The Walking Dead. <laughs> that is like literally the guy was in a coma in Atlanta, Georgia, next to the CDC and woke up to a pandemic and like that is the actual plot of that TV show, right? And that's how unreal this is. Yeah, like we know the outcome of we that show went on for thirteen seasons. Like it's it's I don't know. It's time to move into a bus and storm a prison. Apparently, um, right. I don't know. Yeah. What we're, we I don't, don't know how the show ended. I gave up on it. It was weird. Yeah, we don't want to go thirteen weeks. Yeah, 13 seasons. That's what I mean. Yeah, 13 years, right. Yeah. We don't, we don't want none of that. Awesome. So I have some questions for you, Robert. Okay. So uh, what was your favorite car growing up? 1970 Chevy Nova. Uh, Nova? Chevy Nova, you said? Wonderful. What was special about that car? It was the year I was born. Okay. And I worked and paid for it myself. Congratulations. Now, what was the worst car you owned? Yeah. I, I have... have you ever owned a Dodge Stratus? Because it would be that. Okay, let me tell you, right? Yeah, you did. Being, being a Southern boy, we don't drive. We only drive Chevy. We don't drive okay. Dodge. And no Dodge Stratus. How about a no Chevy? Ford. Uh, Oh God! Let's see. Let's think of a Cavalier. Did you have a Cavalier? No, I had. A, I had. I did have a Chevy Spectrum with a Suzu motor in it. What is that? I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it was a little car. I bought it. I bought it when I worked in the White House in D.C. I didn't even have a driver's license. I bought it, and, and a buddy of mine drove it home from D.C. to New Orleans with no license. That sounds illegal, but yeah, I'm into it. Um, Best it wasn't, breakdown. It wasn't illegal because I didn't get caught. What's your best car breakdown story? Yeah. The worst story is me in a big Chevy van driving from New York to New Orleans to pick up my bro my younger brother, who's deceased, God bless him. We drove to Springfield, Missouri. Arkansas picked up two 58, 158, 156 Carmagia and pulled them back. Wow. So you've always been into the VWs? Yeah. Yeah, always. And early ones, too. Have you ever had any split window buses? I was never into buses. Oh, crazy, man. Look know, at what it, the value it, of those did. Yes. It, it's, yeah, it's like hilarious. I get people all the time who are like, Hey, do you know anyone with one of those split window buses? I'm like, absolutely. I know tons of people. How many hundreds would you like to spend? The record is now three. And they're like, $300? I'm like, $300,000. Yeah. 
Do you have three hundred thousand dollars? I'll get you one. You got right. one hundred thousand dollars. I'll get you one. Yeah, they they went through the roof. Well, and the synchros are doing that too now. So the the one I have, the four wheel drive one, which I mean, it makes sense. They made less of them than they made the you know twenty one window splits. So, and they're they're super desirable, but yeah, it's it's a weird. The I I was there to watch the split window bus market do what it did. You know, I was in the I was in it when it went from I could buy that for five thousand dollars to that is now seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah, kind of just like that. It yeah, it was like over the course of a couple of years. It was it was weird. Yeah. Okay, so those are your bus breakdown stories. What is your favorite fish to eat? Vegetarian. Okay, except for the dairy products that you consume. Okay, what is your favorite cheese? Cheddar makes it better. Cheddar's pretty good. Mild cheddar or like a sharp cheddar? What a I smoked can do cheddar. I could do both. Yeah. Either, I'm good with either one. Sometimes mild cheddar is good, but uh, I mean sometimes sharp is good, but sometimes it takes a, if if it can be you're not sharp. Eating, yeah, you're not eating something to counter the sharpness. It's it's kind of distracting. It can definitely be too sharp. The sharpness can be very distracting. I like smoked cheeses. I think that can add a texture. Well, not a texture, but like this subtle flavor that just solves problems. Have, have you have you had smoked scarmozza? I have not. What's uh what's a smoked scarmozza? Scarmozza is aged mozzarella. Oh, that sounds good. And it's smoked. How about how weird mozzarella is? You like barely make a cheese and then you kill it in vinegar and leave it in the fridge. Like it, it really is. It's like barely so, a cheese. So you, like, so you're a cheese head. I like cheese. Um, I would say uh, I like sheep cheeses the most. Like I like it. I I think of all the animals you make a cheese out of. Like I haven't had all the animals. I've had like relatively normal farm animals. I would totally eat hamster cheese, but like I don't know anyone making it. Um, but yeah, I think like like sheep cheese is because it's got that higher fat content, and it just like same with goat cheese. Like, dude, cow cheese is like boring. Call me crazy. Goat 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 cheese is is not bad. Do do you do stinky cheeses like the French stuff? I can do some of them. Um, like I like the like moldy cheeses, like the blues and the gorgonzolas. But like gorgonzola has such a unique spice character to it. Like you put that on. Gorgonzola's like, not bad. It's tough. It like it it hits you, and you're like, I don't know where this flavor came from. I thought this was cheese. Yeah, <laughs> but I can't get with blue. Blue is just a it's a creamier gorgonzola. Yeah, I can't get with that, and I can't do stinky. We got I don't stinky much, but we got this awesome place down here that probably has 200 cheeses that they'll cut. Um, and they really know they really know their stuff. So you can go in there and be like, I want a creamy cheese that's gonna go with vanilla wafers and um, dates. And they'll be like, Oh yeah, we got this one that goes perfectly with that's, the combination that's, of That's not a bad combo. Yeah. That actually isn't a bad combo. I was trying to think up a bad combo, but if you went in there and said like deep fried Oreos and um, steak, and they'd be like, These two things don't normally go together. But we have this cheese that goes perfectly with both. Uh, so what you Wait, want is let me a, ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, since you, since you, you, you borderline disgusting things, have you had hog head cheese? Yeah. That's not good. Don't eat that. No, it, uh, it's all of, all of the cheese stuff. Like, I mean, everyone has their own taste in cheese, but what I think is really exciting is when you get a little excited about cheese and you go like beyond the buying the what's the swiss that everyone gets the jarlsberg you know yeah, you go I, beyond I the jarlsberg swiss. and the sharp new york cheddar and you go down the aisle and you're like i don't know what this is and you try it and you're like oh this baby swiss has this like pungent bite you know it's got this little extra thing going on and okay hold, hold, hold a minute hold a minute let me pause you okay so your cheese fascination yeah. complements your macaroni and cheese yeah like i said i mean this i knew i knew i knew you were too damn smart 
to make a good mac and cheese. I'm still convinced the best macaroni and cheese is Kraft Blue Box, but not necessarily with the standard noodles. When you get into the textured noodles, like the SpongeBob's or the Spider-Man noodles, um, <laughs> I think the noodle construction there is a little different, and it's got kind of like a more cardboardy noodle. You, um, you, 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 you are too sophisticated for a proper macaroni and cheese. So I used to live on this $12 million yacht I was taking care of, and uh, I always would do wine pairings and beer pairings of very exotic things with terrible food. So I would do like Easy Mac and a $400 bottle of wine I found in the cupboard. And I'd post all that to the internet. It was like, it, 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 yeah, it pissed some people off. It was kind of fun. But uh, I will say, you cannot beat a rosé in the summer, a cold rosé. I'm not, not even a big wine person, but a cold rosé like just hits the spot and it pairs so freaking well with Kraft macaroni and cheese. The blue box stuff with the SpongeBob noodles, it is fantastic. Any, any rosé, it's just perfect. <laughs> uh, no? no, thank you. Okay, so what, um, in terms of cheese, like, you say you, you, your grandma's mac and cheese was the best, like, what mac and cheese would you, your mom's, what mac and cheese would you make today? Like, are you a Velveeta guy? Or are you like a, I know, I've never gone Velveeta, but I hear people love it. It's creamy, it's delicious. I've, I've, um, there's actually a recipe a while ago that I used that was good. But in my mac and cheese, I use cheddar, mozzarella, um, about four or five cheeses. Mm -hmm. And on top, I layer it with frosted flakes. Okay. That's legit. I like that. Have you ever put a little cream cheese in it? Cream cheese is a cheese. So cream cheese is this magical cheese because when you warm it up, it kind of, it, you know, it gets creamy. It just adds cream. But let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something, right? Ain't no real black people putting cream cheese in a mac and cheese. I'm not talking about a lot of cream cheese. I'm talking about three spoonfuls of like a little bit. We, we don't even have damn cream cheese in the refrigerator. What are you using cream cheese, cheese for? Dude, this is not cottage cheese. That just sounds terrible. We, we don't have that in the fridge either. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great cheese. Um, but what do you do with cottage cheese? You just eat it. You just, that's straight up. It's its own snack. I don't know of any. That's some nasty looking stuff. I legitimately don't know of any recipe that has ever called for cottage cheese. Like, if I. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know why? why? You know why, right? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine, like, you're looking at this recipe, and it's like, and then you add two cups of cottage cheese. I'd be like, there's no way that's right. <laughs> <laughs> there's, just, there's no chance. I'm not a chef, but I'm not putting cottage cheese in this. Um, it's lasagna. I get it. Like, it is, the cheese is going to melt. Like, it is creamy, but I'm just going with no. I'm, I'm, I'm hard on that one. That's no. But cottage cheese is pretty much Parmesan that just didn't quite get made. It's it's still sort of the same like Parmesan. You just let it chill and it. Co comes cottage and cheese it is nothing together. like Parmesan. It's nothing like Parmesan. It's it, it's almost or mozzarella. I mean mozzarella. Um, you know because it's a soft cheese that's just like just beginning its journey. It's a prepudescent cheese. It's a young cheese. It's a very young cheese. It's it's on its journey. It's. You know it's what? It's like the beginning of the it's, first Lord of the Rings movie, right? It's too that young is to eat. cottage cheese. It's too young to eat. Well, I'm not going to judge when it's too young to eat. It, it, um, I Awful. think, I think it's going to mature and it's going to get to this point where it's ready to go. Um, but cottage cheese is definitely of all the cheeses that are questionable when it's time to eat because it's like half curds in half whey. It's like just totally like mostly given up on whether or not it's ready or not. Like I, mean, I can't, I, even, I can't even believe I'm talking to you about cottage cheese. I know, and this is an agricultural podcast. We should get back to talking about farm animals. So what what do you garden, Robert? I mean, what's what's in your garden right now? I, I at the moment I don't. I'm not, but. What I garden are tomatoes, heirloom okay. tomatoes. Okay. Um, so you eat tomatoes? Lots. I don't lots. eat tomatoes. You don't eat tomatoes? 
No, so there was a date in the 1860s where the first guy ate a tomato, and that's super fucked up. Like, just so we're clear, we've had electricity almost as long as people have eaten tomatoes, and uh, I draw the line. Thing. We've had locomotives thing. longer than tomatoes. It's, look it up. It was, uh, it was a general. Um, here, I'll find the guy's name. Um, the guy literally, so he'd done a bunch of research on whether or not you could eat a tomato, and he did, like, these crazy things where he, like, fed a tomato to a cat and stuff, and then he was like, the cat didn't die. And so the guy was like, you know, an amateur horticulturalist and was like, I think you can eat a tomato. I'm pretty sure. So he did all these experiments and uh, to eat a tomato. And so the crazy thing is, um, well, and they say, yeah, tomatoes were eaten before this, yada, yada, yada. But um, <laughs> hang on. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's... Martin, you're absolutely right. We're talking about cheese. Okay, so Robert Gibbon Johnson. Okay, so Robert Gibbon Johnson uh, was a colonel, Colonel Johnson. And in, let's see here, what was the date that he did it? Because it was like a crazy thing. So he goes to the courthouse and he tells these people, he's like, bro, I'm going to eat a tomato. And the whole town gathers and they're like, no, you're not. There's no way. Like, you can't eat a tomato. He's like, I'm going to do it. I've done this stuff. I'm going to eat a tomato. And the whole town gathered. They tried to stop him because they thought it was going to be like a public suicide attempt. Guy ate a tomato right there, steps to the courthouse, right? Absolutely the craziest thing. So it was, it was in the 1820s, so I was wrong about electricity. I had my dates wrong. But it was the Salem courthouse, uh, and he, he, he did it. He went ahead and ate a tomato, and the guy's a hero. We don't talk about it. He doesn't have a holiday, but. I mean, I guess. So you don't eat tomatoes. No, because I don't believe in it. It's, uh, tomatoes have only been eaten less than 150 years. I have an anvil that's older than when people ate tomatoes. But what does that mean, though? That doesn't mean anything. Sure. That means that's when someone decided to eat them. Uh, exactly. I, I don't believe in them yet. I, I think they're still untested. It's, it's new science. I, I'm not whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. So do you eat tomato sauce? Well, if it's cooked, yeah, because you can eat it then. What the, what not eating a raw tomato. What do you think I am? A raw tomato person? Are you kidding? Wait, wait. So you got this whole conspiracy theory about tomatoes, but you eat tomato theory. sauce. Yeah, if it's cooked. <laughs> Yo, I well, just I'm here to educate. Out. You didn't even know about Sir Robert Gibb and Johnson. Listen, I just figured out what the problem is. You're drinking too many beers. I've had two beers. It's been, it's two beers. It's, it's been a long day. I get two beers at the end of the day. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But I don't think you can handle two beers, though. Well, you deserve two beers. I mean, the guy, to be fair, the guy lived to be 79 years old in the 1830s. He died in, like, 1830. Like, that's cr He died in 1850, October 2nd, to be fair. Because um, he was eating tomatoes. I can't believe the guy lived to be almost 80 and ate a freaking tomato. It's it was crazy. a tomato that prolonged his life. No. No way. Yeah, and, you should I mean, you should read can a you imagine further. the outrage of the people? They were like, he's going to do it. That guy, he's, he's going to eat it. And then people would be around the town the next day. They'd be like, dude, you won't believe what I saw. That guy, you know, the, the colonel, the military guy? I fucking ate a tomato. Just like it was an apple. He just put it in his mouth. Yeah, but, but ignorance is not a knock on a tomato. I'm just saying, man, they're too new. I'm not, not into too it. Too new? Yet. Yeah, 200 years, barely. That's in this country, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's not in Italy. I get it. The Aztecs ate tomatoes. Other people ate tomatoes. All I'm saying is this country, we only have 200 years of tomato history, and we've been eating cheese a lot longer. I trust the cheese. <laughs> okay. You can All cook right. it, but I don't know about that raw stuff. All right. So listen, I got to get out of here. It's almost 8 o'clock. I know. It's been a weird day. What happened? How did we end up doing this twice? <laughs> listen, it was good until it went into the cheese. Yeah, we got some good cheese talking. 
Um, Some I, think could, I think you could edit a solid seven minutes out of this entire two hours. No, I'm, we're going to leave it all. Now, listen, Ben, Ben from chef to table is a chef. Okay. Right? So, potatoes? Now, and Martin is from St. Louis, which is a soulful place. Of course they eat tomatoes. No, people don't eat tomatoes. Of course they eat tomatoes. Now, my question to Ben and Martin is, have you had mac and cheese that didn't have macaroni in it? Just other pasta. A different noodle. A different noodle. Yeah. Well, but everyone has. We've all had spirals and SpongeBob's. It was, and it's delicious. Yeah. I'm just saying it can't be spaghetti. It's just another pasta. It's the wrong consistency. It doesn't have the <laughs> airspace. It's, you need to, okay, so Darcy's law, Darcy's law in, in hydrology is Q is equal to minus KIA. And it's used to measure the intrinsic permeability of an aquifer. So how well does water move through a pore space underground? You see, this is Darcy's what I'm talking law about. Is directly applicable. This is the pasta. point that I'm this is the point that I'm making, right? Okay. You're too philosophical to make proper mac and cheese. No, I'm just saying if you don't have a negative Q value, and like if your Q value is positive and you don't have an intrinsic permeability, you can't make pasta out of that because it cannot spread evenly. <laughs> it won't permeate. All right. So I'm going to head home. cannot have the same value as Lacustrian clay. That's all let, I'm saying. Okay, let me tell you something, right? Okay. When this all ends, yeah. give it a couple of years, you and I are going to go ahead to Mardi Gras. Dude, I'm pumped. We're going to make some, I'm going to make Kraft mac and cheese. No, 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 no. You're not what? making nothing. Okay. We're going to go to Mardi Gras. Yeah. Right? We're hang out with my mom and she'll cook. She got Kraft? I can bring it. Z no. They don't have it there. No, you just eat. Nobody, nobody's eating no Kraft mac and cheese. Okay, okay, okay. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Um, no, Mardi Gras, I'm, I'm down with that. I love all, right, love we, all the and it's, it, We do it. She yeah. love it. I, I look forward to it. I think we'll have a fantastic time. We'll, we'll make all of the craziest of mac and cheeses. It'll be great. And We won't be making know. anything. My mom will cook. Okay, that's fine. I'll get arrested in the street, but we'll have to get a street permit for a uh, parade. You know that three people constitutes a parade if you get a permit 30 days in advance, right? <laughs> With you, me, and my mom won't be in a parade, dude. <laughs> no, no. You me, you, me, and your mom can be a parade. We can get <laughs> streets shut down. We can get a police escort and yes. submit our route 30 days in advance, and they will shut down lights for us because we're an accredited parade. Right. Okay. If I'm going to New Orleans, I'm starting a parade of three people. So that's you can have mac and cheese, but we're going to be in a parade. That's my deal. Break. All right. We'll, we'll yeah. figure it out. It sounds fun. Well, this All has right. been fun. This is a solid way to spend a whatever day of the week it is. March 96th. Yes. Hump day. Yeah. All right, my brother. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Be good. Thank you all for tuning in. Yeah, this was fun. All right. Good night.